So great, I'm really glad that you're here today because we're going to talk about the challenge that's before you, which is really to think about reimagining learning. And one way to do it is to really take this idea, this question of how could we improve the way someone learns to, and then you're going to fill in that blank. And that could really be anything. And by extension, if we think about what's the future school going to look like, the future school is going to have to tackle this question. And it's an important one because the way I look at it, is the future of the school is about you guys. You guys are really designing the schools that you will learn from. And the things that you think about and the ways that you learn are going to be inherent in the design of that school. So the future school is really going to be designed by you. But who are you guys, really? I'm going to tell you a little bit about my observations of you as people who learn stuff. And then I'm going to tell you about some of my ideas that are sort of... Uh, kind of crazy ideas about how school might look different. But I'm hoping that you'll take that as a springboard and start thinking about ideas that nobody's ever thought up before about what a future school might look like. So some of the things that I've observed about teaching young people is you are creative. You're really creative and you think outside the box and I think that's really special. <clears throat> because creativity I think starts with asking questions and you're very good at asking those kinds of questions. You're asking creative questions that don't just start with why. I mean, for me, in my generation, I ask questions all the time. I see things and I say, why? Um, how could we improve the way that someone learns how to dance, to conduct experiments, to help autistic kids learn to read? That's, those are how questions. And how questions are actually more powerful than why questions because it starts leading us to some solutions. And so for the first step is really to pose a question and then to think about what are some possible solutions? And finally, to share some of those ideas. And you'll be able to do all three of those things. Now, like I said before, in my generation, we tend to ask why. I was in Long's Drugs the other day, and I saw this right guard deodorant. And it immediately made me ask this question, why? Because if you look at it, at the top, it's deodorant that's 96 hours of extended protection. OK, isn't that a little weird? Like, why? Are you not going to take a bath for 96 hours? I mean, that's kind of scary, right? I mean, we don't want to think too much about that. that. But that's like why, right? Robert Kennedy said this quote, which I think is a great one. There are those, like me, who look at things the way they are and ask why. But I dream of things that never were, and I ask why not. And I think that's the power of your generation and your creativity, is you don't just ask why. You ask why not. You ask how. Here's another why question that I ran into over the summer. I was in Los Angeles and I was in an elevator and I saw this warning sign, right? Um, Should the elevator doors fail to open, do not become alarmed. There is little danger of running out of air or of this elevator dropping uncontrollably. Okay, I wasn't worried about those things before I read the sign. Now I'm really worried. So my question is, okay, well, why? You know, why, why do you need to say those things? I mean, really, I'm happy you're living in ignorance. <laughs> but, uh, but for those of you out there, you're probably thinking in terms of why not? Some of you may, might, might be already dreaming up ideas about how could I invent a portable oxygen unit maybe that provides air or really big springs. So if it falls uncontrollably, it comes to a softer landing. That's the power of really thinking about why not and how. You know, there was a... Uh, a thinker named, great, great thinker named Seymour Papert in the area of learning. And he once said that if a teacher from the 17th century came into the 21st century, they would feel perfectly at home in the modern classroom. And so I looked up, you know, this is a drawing of a classroom in Philadelphia in the 1800s. And this is a classroom in a college today. They kind of look the same, you know, not much has changed. So, I mean, there's a problem here because you're really different and the way that you learn is different fundamentally than we were in the 1800s and yet the classrooms really haven't evolved. So what should the classroom of the future look like? Well, here's one idea that I have. Here's a why not. Why not make schools into questioning labs so that instead of being a place that you go to learn more about stuff that people have already found the answers to, what if it becomes a lab where you go to ask more questions and investigate those questions? 
What if schools were really more like this? This comes from a game I used to play. This is an adventure game, but this is supposed to be Leonardo da Vinci's workshop. And you'll notice in his workshop, he really sort of has little areas that are set aside for all the different things that he does. He's got an alchemy station, he's got a place for drawing and sketching. You know, Leonardo da Vinci was the original Renaissance man, right? He was an artist, he was an inventor, he was a sculptor, he was a great thinker. He was all of those different things, and so his creative working space kind of fit all those different areas. What if our schools were more like this? What if they were more like workshops or ateliers? where you work under an apprenticeship with someone rather than just go there and learn from one person lecture style. But if you think about it, there's something that's familiar maybe to some of you anyway. This is, this is our robotics lab. And the robotics lab is kind of like an atelier. It's kind of like a studio. You work through apprenticeship. They have different stations that are set up to do different things. They have all the tools that you need to do your learning right there. I mean, it really is more of a question lab. It's a place to collaborate and work together with other people. So maybe that's one example of what a future school might look like. So here's the other thing that I know about you. Besides being creative and asking great questions, you're playful. You like to play games. And the thing about play that's really special is we're born knowing how to play. Nobody has to teach you how to play. Right? And, and play is universal. Play occurs in all cultures. It occurs across the globe. It, uh, you know, even animals play. So play is something that's really universal and you don't need to be taught how to play. Here's an example from Dr. Andy Clark. He had this great quote about the idea of neuroplasticity, which is basically that your brain develops and shapes and changes based on the conditions that you put before it. So the kinds of challenges you give your brain help your brain to grow. So if that's the case, then how do we learn school? And what happens to the development of our brain when we spend our childhood basically learning a set of fixed rules. In, in other words, learning all the things that you need to do to be successful and get the grades in school. You learn how to do things in certain ways. You learn what the hoops are so you can jump through them. You try to get school to be as predictable as possible so you know the right answers and you know the way, you know the way to go. You're treading the same path that hundreds of other students have tread before you. What does that do to your brain? I ask myself that question a lot. You know, here's one example that I've observed is that, you know, often kids will walk away from homework because it's too hard. But when do you walk away from a computer game? Well, sometimes you walk away because it's too easy. Like sometimes the same challenges we relish in computer games, when you see it in the form of a more structured assignment, it's somehow it's less engaging. You know, this is a great quote from Tom Sawyer that basically says that he's trying to, dis he's trying to talk about the difference between work and play. And that work is everything that you are obliged to do. Everything you have to do is work. And play is everything else. But the idea that you have to do something makes it work. Even though it might be the same task. And so I think what, what Tom Sawyer is really talking about is this idea of choice. And choice is really powerful when it comes to feeling engaged. Engaged with a subject, engaged with something you're doing. Choice is really, really important. And games embody choice. Games constantly give you a choice of different things to do. You, you rarely have games now that have one way to solve something. Usually it's a multi-branching storyline and there are many different ways to do it. And so because of that, games are really motivating and they're really addictive. They can also be productive learning. But I just said addictive. How can we make learning as addictive as games? I asked that question to one of my, one of my students one year and listen to what he had to say. What, what do you think makes a game addictive? Um, <laughs> oh man, uh, probably the sense that you, you, you never completed enough. Like there, uh, in Minecraft there, for example in Minecraft there is no ending, there is no story. You just play and keep on playing and you set your own goals and once you complete those goals you've already thought of new ones. So really it's like an endless like list of tasks that you have to complete. So an endless list of tasks that you have to complete. And that sounds a lot like work, doesn't it? <laughs> but how many people here have played Minecraft? We all have, right? Now I've got a whole list of things back in my world that I've got to complete. I've got to like build a fence around my uh, yard, I've got to build a house. I've got to do all these different things, but it doesn't feel like work because it's something that I'm choosing to do. 
And that's something that's really powerful and it's something that we don't do well in schools yet. We're not really good about giving you guys enough choice in terms of your learning and what you do and how you display your learning. Well, we're trying to find ways to get better and that's where you can help us. I often think, what if schools were more like Minecraft? If we think about that, right? If we think about the choice that Minecraft embodies, what happens if we make schools more like Minecraft? So let me give you an example from a real class. So last year, I said to you know, this group, uh, I want you to build my new office. It's got to be underwater, it's got to be big, and it has to have elements of nature in it, like trees and plants and flowers and things like that. But it's got to be underwater. And you know in Minecraft, if you're, you need air underwater, otherwise you drown. So we had to brainstorm how to do it. And so the class decided, okay, what we need to do is build a dome, build a glass dome underwater. And so in order to figure out, and I said, by the way, I'm not going to give you any sand or glass. You've got to get it all yourself in your community. And so they had to figure out, okay, who has the most sand? Who can go out and gather sand? How much sand is that, really? And how much coal is that to fire the sand to make the glass? And so they found online this tool that generates a sphere and it tells you how much glass is there. And they realized that it's really a huge, huge, huge amount of glass. <laughs> but then what was really cool is at one point, one student kind of stands up and he goes, hey, wait a second, I just realized something. We're all assuming that we're bisecting the sphere. But if you cut it closer to the top, you don't lose that much surface area, but you use substantially less glass. And he was absolutely right. And then everybody started scribbling on pieces of paper. We started figuring out on graph paper, okay, what's the perfect amount? Because the farther up you go, you start losing proportionally more surface area. And so there is a sweet spot where you can cut it where you're not going to lose that much area. And that's real math that's involved in figuring this out. But it was in the context of something that was really important, which is building a new office for me. <laughs> Underwater. Absolutely. And so with their plan, what they decided to do was they decided to build it out of sand because they didn't want to all be working underwater. They built it on sand on top of a wooden platform. And when the dome was built, they were going to burn out the wood underneath and it would fall straight to the bottom of the ocean. At which point they'd have another team of kids go down there and cover the whole thing with glass and then dig out all the sand and then another group would come in and actually build the office. So this is the plan. And this is a significant amount of work, which is why it was a group project. So here, they're, here they are, they're actually starting to, they actually made a music video out of this. So everybody kind of took camera footage from their own perspective while they dropped it down. This is actually the big day when we kind of like, and it went through the night and they burned it out. So, so you can see, you know, this is what it looked like from underneath. And then we had chests that were built, so people were constantly getting sand and getting glass and putting them up there and put, filling the chests with sand. And to me, an ideal group project is something where everybody's involved. I mean, how many of you have ever had a group project given to you where any one person in the group could have done the project? It was just given to you because it was like, oh, well, we have to have people collaborating? That, that's not a real group project, that's a fake group project, right? If one person can do it, that's a fake group project. A real group project is one where you need skills and collaboration from lots of different people. So we had all different, you know, we had a security team, for example, because while we were solving all these engineering problems and building the dome, we actually had skeleton archers there taking pot shots at people while they were trying to do their job. How rude, right? So we had to have a security team to deal with just with that. So there was a part for everybody to play in this. <laughs> and as you work on your own teams, think about that. Think about what are the skills that everybody on your team brings to that team and how can you leverage that to make everybody play a valuable role. And there's the finished office. And it's, you know, and in the end, about you know, three kids burned to death and a few of them drowned, but my office looks awesome. <laughs> so here's the other thing that I've observed about you, okay? Besides being creative, and besides being playful and understanding games and choice, you're also makers. In other words, you see a problem, you come up with a solution to, to try to solve it. And more often than not, you share those solutions out. 
So besides coming up with questions, we're actually building solutions, which is pretty cool. The maker credo is basically if you can't open it, you don't own it. Makers like to get in under the hood to tinker with things. I think understanding and learning how to code is a big part of that because code is what runs things under the hood more often than not. And so getting in there, rolling up your sleeves and messing with code, that's part of the maker mindset as well. So here's one question that uh, a school in Burlington actually came up with, which was how can we improve the way that Frankie learns to get around the classroom? And Frankie's a student who was born without a right hand. And they wanted to find ways to uh, improve his access to things in the classroom. And so what they actually did is they took a look at his old prosthetic device and tried to design a new one. The problem with prosthetic arms traditionally is they're really heavy. And as his arm, he's growing. And every time, you know, as he's growing, the, the arm just doesn't fit as nicely. And they're expensive. A prosthetic arm can cost between ten and twenty thousand dollars. But you can buy plans on the internet and 3D print all these different kinds of hands. People are collaboratively designing different kinds of hands. And so this, this group decided to take on the challenge of custom fitting a 3D printed prosthetic arm from the internet for Frankie. And so they worked with an organization called Enable. And here they are actually fitting his arm into a cast. And then they were able to take measurements. And this is something you couldn't do with an off-the-shelf kind of device. They can custom make this thing. This is also the reason why the conventional arms are so expensive. But they could do this basically on their table in their classroom. And then they put it onto a computer and they 3D printed his hand. And that whole process cost about $50. So $20,000 versus $50. And now they've, incre they've basically increased his access to just about everything that he can do with the hand. And they can print out multiple designs to test them out, which you couldn't do before. And so now Frankie's on the internet. He's looking for like the next arm. So like next year, as his arm's gotten bigger, he wants one that's got more fingers or one that can pick up more things or be stronger. And so these are all things that can be done because they've really sort of tried to envision this, you know. But what's really neat is that they've taken what a lot of people would look at as a disability and they've made it an ability for him. It's an extra ability. I mean, how many of us have ever thought about what if you could redesign your own hand and use a different hand? And Frankie can do that every day now. He can think about what are the capabilities. He sees it as a strength now rather than as a challenge. So here's another example uh, from my own class. We do apps, right? And so one of my students took on this question, how can we improve the way that autistic kids learn how to count? And he actually worked with, a, uh, with Xcode, and he learned how to code in Xcode and Objective-C, and he worked with a parent of an autistic child, and she had come up with this way for autistic kids to learn to count, and they put an app in the App Store, and she actually designed it for her own kid, but now it's being used all over the world by teachers and therapists and people who work with kids on all, all areas of the autism spectrum. And what's really cool is that this app would never have existed if it weren't for that connection between a parent who really knew nothing about app development and my student who, well, really didn't know anything about autism. And now they both know a whole lot more because of that connection. So it's very powerful. It's a way to really think about using your coding skills to help others and make a difference in the world. And here's the other thing about it. Besides being creative and playful and being able to make stuff, you're also connected. You're the most connected generation, I think, like ever. You've got the internet, you've got all of these social networks. You're very connected and so that has fundamentally changed the way that you learn and it's also changed the way that you can share with others. And that's very powerful. So if you ask yourself this question, how do you learn something new? What's really interesting is your answer is probably completely different from my answer. Because my answer to that traditionally, if I want to learn something new, is I go ask somebody smarter than me. Or I go find an authority figure who can give me that information, or I look in a book. Uh, so for instance, when I wanted to learn how to shave, uh, you know, I asked my dad. And my dad said, okay, sure, son, I'll show you how to shave. And it was like this great father-son bonding moment that I always expected I'd have with my own son. And so, um, you know, but like last year, I was going to CVS to, to uh, go shopping and my son goes, hey dad, can you pick me up a razor and some shaving cream? And I was like, oh, great, this is the moment. Let me, uh, you know, roll up my sleeves and we'll, you know, let me show you how to shave. And he goes, dad, I already know how to shave. And I was like, what? what? 
How, how did you know how to shave? Like, who taught you how to shave? And I'm trying to think. And he goes, oh, well, I went on YouTube. And it turns out if you go on YouTube and you look for how to shave, there's like 800,000 other dads who are all willing to teach, you know, my son how to shave. <laughs> and, and you don't know how that made me feel, you know? It, I actually felt like a success as a teacher. I was like, wow, that's pretty amazing that you knew how to do that. And in fact, for most of the things that he wants to know, he goes and he finds his own resources and finds things out and figures things out. And that's because he, like you, is so connected. So here's another how can we improve question. How do we improve the, sh the way that we share our learning? There's a company out there that has actually, one of, the, one of their solutions to this problem they're actually called DIY.org. And this is a really cool website. If you haven't checked it out, they have an app also. And it provides lots of different ways to learn how to do things. And kids go on this and they learn how to do these different challenges and they share it. And that's the neatest thing about it. All these different challenges. And so here's a student who she actually built, she, the challenge is build your own candy dispenser. So you can see as you scroll down here, people are commenting, right, and putting in comments. She actually is like, I'm going to post the plans, but you need a drill press to get this done. So information about tools. But see, the difference here is she isn't just doing the solution. She's actually sharing it. And that's, I think, really important for learning is DIY is really a community of makers who have come up with all these projects and are sharing out how they're doing it and other people are improving it and working on it. DIY actually has a number of tracks so if you decide you want to be a game designer they actually have a number of challenges for the game design track but again you know typically with schools we'd say okay you want to be a game designer you got to do all these different things. They've actually got a number of challenges here and remember how I talked about choice? They've got like a number of different challenges and maybe you have to do eight out of the 15. And, but you choose which ones you want to do and then you get the badge. So you have a choice of how you progress through it. It's very game-like. And the other interesting thing about it is if you take a look at it, a lot of these don't really have to do with technology. And that's the other key thing. The future school doesn't have to be about technology. It's really about things that are that are bigger than technology. Things like building in choice. Building in ways for people to choose how they learn best. And the technology is, is pretty important because it's what's used to share. In order to share the learning, you need technology. The fact that we all have video cameras in our pockets essentially with our phones, or a lot of people have access to those. All right, that, that, this wouldn't happen without the technology, but the technology is not the center of it. So again, I think to summarize, schools really should be for everybody. And ultimately, school is most powerful when you're building a community around it. And that's why I feel so strongly about the idea of community in the classroom. And in fact, my definition of community is the sum of all of the interactions between the individuals in the classroom. And if I'm teaching a class where all of the interactions are between me and you as individuals, we don't really have a community. What we have essentially is a series of transactions. You know, I've got the grade you want, you've got the work I want, let's make a trade. And that's not the best community. The good community is one where you know each other as individuals as well. When we talk about negotiation, this is a famous story from negotiation, which is the idea about how to split up an orange. So if we had a challenge of let's split this orange, what's the fairest way to split an orange between two people? If those people don't know very much about each other, you would probably say the fairest way to split the orange is to s just slice it in two. And that's fair. Nobody has any more than the other person, right? Everybody has exactly half an orange. But let's say we knew something about each other and we knew more about why we wanted that orange. And maybe we find out that the reason I want the orange is for the zest. I'm making like a couple of cakes and you need the orange peel to grate. And then maybe the reason why you want it is you'd like to make a glass of orange juice. If we knew that, we might come up with an alternate way of splitting that orange up that's just as fair, but gets each of us twice as much as we would have normally had. And that's known as creating value. 
And that's the idea behind a community. A community seeks to create shared value together. But it only happens when we've communicated our, in our interests to each other, when we've communicated what's important, and when you know the person on the other side of the table. That's how you create shared value. I'm gonna close with this idea of stone soup. This is a story that you might be familiar with. You have these three soldiers that come to town and they're starving and the village doesn't have much food and they say, we don't have anything. And the soldiers say, well, that's okay. We'll make stone soup. So they say, let's get a cauldron and we'll fill it with stones and we'll f they fill it with water and they, they sip the hot water and they say, this stew is not very good. I think we need some spices. And so someone says, oh, well, I've got some spices. And then somebody else says, well, I, I, I've got some vegetables. And somebody else puts vegetables in it. And then some other people decide, well, they've got some meats and some other things that they've got just sitting around. And they throw that in the stew. And pretty soon, they have this huge feast. It brings the whole village together around this stone soup. And everybody says, wow, this is amazing, this stone soup that these strangers brought to town. But for me, the moral of the stone soup story, and a silly thing, of course, they didn't bring anything to town, right? It was already there. But for me, the moral of the story is, without the stone, no soup gets made. You needed somebody to bring the stone. You needed somebody to be the catalyst for that to happen. And once somebody brought the stone, then we created this stone soup together. But you'll probably, you may be in leadership roles in your teams where you're going to need to bring that stone. And getting things started doesn't mean coming in with a plan that's already fully formed. It's not coming to town and saying, look, everybody taste this delicious soup that I made. That's not your role and it's not my role as a teacher. Your role as a leader is to find the talents of the people in your groups, the people in your teams, find out what they do well, find out more about them, build those relationships so that you can essentially come up with something together. So you can cook together, basically. And so when we ask this question, this world-class kind of question, how can we improve the way that people do things, we really are asking a question that we already have the talents to learn. Rather than looking outward within your teams and your groups, you're really looking inward. You already know what you need to learn. You already know what it is you need to learn. So who are you really? When I look at you, this is what I see. I see a group of connected, creative, gamers and makers. I see talented people who can really help us with this problem. My generation, we, we don't, we, we're not going to figure this out. It's going to be your generation that figures out what the future school looks like. But I feel so confident with your group doing it because of the talents that you have. I know that you can help us figure this out and I know that nobody else can. It has to be you. So go forward, give it your best thought and I'm really excited about seeing what you come up with. That's it. Thanks.